Hello and welcome back to Unearth the Past, a brand new family history and genealogy podcast brought to you by me, Dr. Michaela Hume. So have you got Irish ancestors? I bet you have. And are you struggling in terms of what records are out there and how you go about finding them? Well, if you are, this is the week for you. I am joined not just by one, oh no, I am joined by two Irish genealogists who are experts in Irish history. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, Dr. Jennifer Doyle and Eamon Healy. Now all that's left is to cue some Irish music. I have Irish ancestry. Now, Jenny is a bit smiley about this because Jenny knows that I have an Irish ancestor that I hate. And the reason I hate this Irish ancestor is because they are playing some sort of sick hide and seek game with me. And it's getting to a point that if this Irish ancestor doesn't decide whether it's Smith, S-M-I or S-M-Y, T-H, I'm about to drive to Hollyhead, get on a boat and go to the parish and physically find her myself. Um, and we've looked, haven't we, Jenny? We have, yes. we have tried. We have tried to find this person. We think we may know where she is, um, but she has made me very, very cross. But let's take her out of the equation for the moment. If somebody uh, has just started their family tree and they have discovered they have an Irish ancestor, where do they start? Where do they start looking? I don't know if you want to start, Jenny, and then Amy, maybe you can pick up after. Uh, okay, so I'll start. I'll, the, I'll start with civil records. So... Unlike England or Scotland, which got a uh, civil registration in 1837 and 1855, respectively, Ireland didn't start civil registration until 1864. Now, before that, we actually did register Protestant marriages from 1845, which are standard births, marriages and deaths only begin in 1864. So if you're starting in, say, the 20th century, you're going to go look at your civil registration in the first instance and the website to do that it's all these are all digitized up to about 1922 for births um 1942 for marriages and i think about 1972 for deaths is uh, irishgenealogy.ie and it's run by the irish department of heritage and what this is it's a fantastic resource and it has all the historical birth records up to those dates and the deaths and the marriages um, so that's going to be the first place. Um, Eamon, where would you go next? Well, I'll preempt you, Jenny, um, because I, was, I had a bit more time to think about the question, obviously. So it's, it's a very common problem. Uh, and the first thing I would say is, is talk to your, your parents or your grandparents and see if there's any information yes. there regarding a county of origin. I mean, at the very least, you're going to need a county of origin to start looking for Irish ancestors. Um, and religion is not a very important factor in terms of what kind of records may survive or where to look next. So, for example, the type of work that we do every day as professional genealogists, uh, our clients are generally from outside of Ireland. And we'd always advise them to look at as many records for the person in the country where they went first before going back to Ireland. So in your case, Michaela, for example, the first thing we would say is if, if the person has gone from Ireland to England, if they're, if they're Catholic or Church of Ireland or Church of England as, as they would have been in, in England, we want to look at those records and see, does it give any inkling of where they're from beforehand? The same with the census records in, in the country where they migrate to. The same with uh, military records. Uh, you're really looking for any kind of clue of a county of origin at the very least, and then a parish, um, depending on the type of record. So, I mean, I kind of preempted Jenny there, but I mean, it really ties in with, with Jenny's record set there. I mean, you really need the county of origin before you start yeah. looking at civil records. Um, and of course, those, those records, like you think about the 1939 register in, in, in the UK, that gives a very specific birth date and mm -hmm. quite often they're very accurate. So you can line that up if you have civil birth records that Jenny talked about as well. Now, talking more broadly then about records, obviously we've mentioned the civil uh, registration index, which came in a bit later in Ireland than what it did, say, here, here in England. 
in England, uh, we rely a lot on census records. Um, I love a census record. Can you just talk to me a bit about Irish census records and what census records are available to those searching? Um, well, there's not very many. <laughs> so we have two census records. We have 1901 and 1911. There are fragments before that. So in, I, I totally agree in England, in Scotland, every 10 years, you get a nice snapshot of who's living in the country. We did take those censuses, but they're destroyed. We have the demographics for them, but we don't have the names. One thing we do have is pension search forms. So when they introduced the old age pension, if you didn't have a birth record or a baptism record, you could write to the Census Bureau and they would search the census for you and say, yes, Michaela was definitely alive in 1851. And you could then use that to apply for your pension. That's the, uh, one of the only records we have of that census though. There's a couple of fragments up around the north, Cavan, where your uh, Smiths are from, um, some around there, but there's not really very many other than that. Eamon? Yeah, I mean, you've, co you've covered it nicely there, Jenny, and I think it, it, to, to kind of discover what kind of census fragments are there, if you look at the Irish National Archives website, all of those have been yeah. indexed and are up there for free. Um, and the census, census uh, search forms that Jenny talked about cover 1841 and 1851. And that's it, um, as far as I know, at least the ones that are available online. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, it's the reason why Irish research is so difficult, because we have a huge gap prior to 1864 when civil registration begins, depending on the, the survival of church records uh, and land records, which is where, where they really come into their own in, in terms of differences to other countries in terms of what records we typically use first uh, to build out those quick and dirty trees and try and get back as quickly as possible and build out those family, family units. So yeah, I'm starting to ramble there, but I think Jenny covered it nicely there. Yeah, I think they're just picking up on that. I mean, I think I know um, that Tracing your Irish ancestors can be difficult, um, as you well know. I've got one that I hate. It is it is hard, isn't it? It's not, yeah. sort of thinking of records, it's not easy. How else do you navigate then that gap? Because, you know, how, how do you, f are there other records, Irish records that can help to fill in the gaps. Yeah, well, I suppose it, 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 it's, an, it's a mixture of everything, right? So what I'm going to say is land records, uh, and it's very important to tie a family to a particular area in Ireland in terms of the land. Um, we have very, very small divisions of land, the smallest one being known as a townland. If you if you can tie somebody to a townland, um, you can trace those land records and follow that family through and build up a family unit. So what's beautiful about those land records, we use them quite typically as a sense of substitute. Um, they're only going to talk about the landholder, the head of the household, or the person who's holding the land or paying the tax on the land. They're not going to give you information about everybody in that household. But if you have it tied to a townland, that allows you then to branch out and look, look at other records in the area, such as church records or court records or dog license records. So really the biggest one that we talk about generally in Irish research is, is Griffith's primary valuation. Yeah. That's essentially a tax, it's a tax record. Um, and it was created to basically value all the land in the country um, in relation to the poor law uh, for the upkeeps. The poor law was established a little bit later in Ireland compared to the, the, the old poor law or the new poor law in England. So it starts off in Ireland in 1838. So Griffith's valuation is a little bit later, so it starts off roughly 1844, right up until the late 1850s. And once you have a family in that record, you can actually track that family to the present up to the 1970s, because those records are essentially kept and maintained right up until the 1970s when land rates are abolished in Ireland. So if you can figure out what family is, is where and what townland, you can follow that townland the whole way through. And sorry, Michaela, I let you in here. Yeah, I was just going to say, what information does that record actually give? So I take it obviously gives the name and maybe where the person lives. Does it give you anything else other than that? It does, yeah. So it gives you the townland. It gives you an exact plot number within that townland. So you can actually trace that exact piece of land where the house would have stood, whether it stands or not anymore, and figure out where that is now. It gives the person's name, the head of the the, the, the head 
leaseholder, um, should I say, the the person they're leasing the land from, because quite often 90% of people aren't owning that land themselves outright, the amount of land in terms of acres, roads, and purchase, the value of that particular land if they're renting um, land, then it also gives a description in what's called the tenement box. So you have, you know, houses, uh, sheds or outbuildings on a farm in there, for example, or if this person was a blacksmith, their forge will be in there, and also the value of their house. So it's essentially, as I said, it's it's a valuation tax. So it's only going to give you valuation on property that they're renting, but that does allow you to gain a little bit more from that. So, for example, if you compare that to other people in the townland, you can see what kind of what way does your ancestor stand in the social scale in terms of economics? Are they renting the poorest house? Are they renting the most expensive house? It also allows you then to figure out, well, who is the landlord? And the landlords will allow you to potentially look at other records. So landlord estate records do survive for some places. And without knowing who the landlord is, you can't look at those. So there is quite a lot of information contained in just that one line of information. How much has DNA helped, and especially with cousin matches, in terms of filling those gap in Irish ancestry? It's been, it's been it's been a huge tool. I, I would say it's tool very strongly. It's it's not foolproof. I mean, DNA has to be interpreted. Um, the DNA itself doesn't tell you anything without corresponding historical research and, and, and documentary research. Um, and the reason I say that is because I'm from the West Coast, uh, and the West Coast typically has higher rates of intermarriages between families, cousin marriages. And as you can imagine, if if you have a very remote area for example, and families start marrying each other, that really skews the DNA. So you have to be careful in terms of, you know, what, what you're looking at when you get cousin matches from Ireland or from different parts of the country um, that are known for being ro- more isolated. But it's been fascinating. I say that that's a caveat, but it's it's definitely been a huge tool. I was very fortunate that when I started working as a professional genealogist about seven years ago, DNA was only really starting to pick up uh, as a tool in research. So I was right at the forefront of learning on the job, essentially. And it's, it's, it's a tool in my arsenal that I couldn't do without today. Um, we often come across brick wall ancestors that have emigrated to different areas, be it Australia, Canada, or uh, the US or wherever. The documents just don't tell us what we need to know. And then we look at DNA and quite often we get a lead. It, now, it can never be definitive without corresponding documents, but that lead wouldn't exist if the DNA didn't exist. So I would say that it's very, very exciting and it's, and it's hugely important. And, and even from myself, I, I look at, you know, I've been doing genealogy for the last 20 years or more. And it, it was, you know, it was a fairly expensive endeavor when you were a poor student um, when I was doing it. And for me, it was really important to try and prove that I had actually discovered the right ancestors and the right families, because you never know if there's been any illegitimate birth or any hanky-panky going on in the past that nobody knows about. And, and that's not going to be recorded in the records. But DNA does allow us to kind of to see that a bit clearly, a bit more clearly than otherwise. So, yeah, so DNA has been really useful. Yeah, I think DNA is something that... It's not that we can't do it without it, of course we can, but we can't back up our documentary findings without it. So it's all well and good researching my Doyle line if I can't, if I don't have matches to the ancestors, I'm at least three or four generations back that I'm researching. Because as Eamon said, someone's dad might not be their dad or someone might have been adopted. And these things weren't were a lot more silent in the past, adoption in particular. So DNA helps us to verify the documentary line, as well as helping us to overcome areas where there are no documents. You need to go into it with those two, those two hats on verification. And what else can I tell me? What else can it tell me? Yeah, I'm sorry to jump in really quickly, Michaela. Just I would say the cousin matching is the most important aspect of DNA. I think a lot of people will, will look at the ethnicity estimate and see, well, how Irish am I? What percentage Irish am I? I mean, it's it's nice to be able to say that, but in terms of serious genealogical research, we don't put too much emphasis on that. As long as those ethnicity estimates align somewhat with what's known about the family, 
then we can look at the DNA cousin matching. And that's where the, the power lies in those cousin DNA matches. I love my DNA cousins. I love them all. I reached out to them. I'm sending them postcards. I'm like connecting with them, you know, in America. And I think I've got Australia. And I just think you never know, do you, when you might need an organ or a kidney. You know what I mean? <laughs> So I'm like, I'm like befriending them, I'm inviting them around for tea, get on a plane. Um, yeah, no, I must admit, I love them. So if you are one of my cousin matches and you haven't had a, a message from me, get in touch. Get in touch. I had someone who messaged me who was actually connected to my dad and my maternal grandmother. What? Which is weirdly. And my my mother and my father are from two very different parts of the country. And all I can think of is that my dad had a great, great grandmother from Bristol and my grandmother's great, great, great grandmother, grandparents or whatever, were also from Somerset. So 300 years ago, there might be a connection between the two, but it was just a very odd message to get. How are you connected to these two people? I think I think I can kind of somewhat top that story, Jenny, and I think you've it. already heard you've already heard this before, but... I mean, what we're talking about now is autosomal DNA, which comes from all of your lines. And the story I'm going to tell is slightly mixing it up a bit and talking about the Y DNA testing, which is only men can take that. And the idea is to follow the male paternal surname. So in my case, Healy is the surname. And it was a running joke when I was growing up, which branch of the Healy's was I from? So Healy is a patronomic surname that starts off in two areas of the country around the same time, one in Sligo, one in Cork. Uh... And where I'm from is kind of splitting the distance. So we never knew which branch potentially we were from. So I thought I'd spit into this tube and figure out where I'm from. And sure enough, I'm not a Healy genetically, uh, which I kind of expected. But it turns out I'm actually uh, of French descent. Now, what's interesting about this is my partner, uh, Leslie, shout out for her. He's French. <laughs> I and, this, and, the, and, the, and the nearest <laughs> DNA match that I had, uh, the closest, should I say, is from the same town as her mother in France. So you never know where where those DNA matches are going to bring you, but more importantly, you never know what kind of questions it's going to make you ask about yourself. Mm. <laughs> yeah, very that. true. Uh, you know what? I found this whole DNA thing fascinating. And in last week's podcast, I had a chat with Laura. I know you guys will, will know Laura um, about DNA because I'm still learning all the time. Look, I'm no DNA expert. I know enough about it i think to get me through uh the research and ex to explain why things have come about for, for tv purposes but you know i'm no expert so last week's uh podcast with laura was uh fantastic and i learned so much new stuff um about dna and uh how it works and cousin matches and ethnicity estimates and and you know where for example, you might have communities in parts of the world where you've not got a DNA match, but you've got a community. So, so that was uh, really fascinating. And I use it a lot now in my research. I, I spoke about this last week, especially when I have somebody come to me and they're adopted and they don't know their birth parents. It's been really, really useful. And I think, Jenny, I think even you've given me advice in the past when I've come to you and said, you know, how do I approach this? And you've been really good and Hello, only me. Sorry to interrupt the podcast. If you are enjoying it and you would like to support the making of this podcast, please visit my Patreon account, which is www.patreon.com forward slash Dr. Michaela Hume. If you are listening to the podcast, please remember to download and even give us a few stars if you think we're good. And if you are watching it on YouTube, please remember to like and subscribe. Now back to the podcast. Can you just pick up then, I know you've mentioned it briefly, why it is so difficult or why it can be so difficult to trace your Irish ancestors? Um, it's okay. So my surname is Doyle. In England, you can trace your ancestors probably back through the parish registers to the late 18th century with relative ease. I can't get my Doyles back beyond 1840 with even with, you know, it's, just ridiculously challenging. Um, it's because the parish registers just don't survive. Right. Um, some par every parish had its own sort of standards for what records it kept. 
Some parishes kept great records. Some parishes kept absolutely shockingly terrible records. And that's why you see sort of this patchwork of, right, the parish records here begin in 1840, but they might not begin in the neighbouring parish less than a mile away until the 1860s. So there's a 20 year gap where all of a sudden you know who's living here, but you don't know who's living there. That's why it's so difficult. And in Ireland, one of the reasons why it is so difficult is there's limited mobility. So in England, people are moving around a lot more. In Ireland, we typically tell our clients that people moved no more than six to 10 miles during their lifetime. So if you think about it, that's not very far. It's about half a day's walk. So if our Irish ancestors didn't travel very far then, why have so many of us got Irish in our DNA? What's going on? What am I missing? Yeah, I mean, I'll try and keep it brief because it's it's a very historical question. And I think that's that's what I love about family history, because you can't take one without the other. You need to have that historical context. And I think the Irish as a people are well known for emigrating and leaving the country um, in different waves. There's three main waves of immigration from the country um, before the famine, during the famine and after the famine to really simplify it. And... I think a lot of the reason that we get people, particularly in the DNA test, going back to what you said, Michaela, um, a lot of our country left in that period just after the famine or, or during it. Um, so you're talking a population of close to 8 million people. Um, after the famine, we're 2 million less, essentially. Uh, 1 million roughly due to the starvation and, and death and the other due to immigration. And that, that immigration keeps going right up into the 1920s. So you have millions of people uh, living outside of Ireland that are born on the island that all of a sudden start leaving a huge amount of descendants wherever they go. So at the very simple levels, that's why there's so many uh, DNA tests with Irish ancestry coming back. But in a way, you can actually reverse engineer that then. So you can see a lot of different DNA companies are using that to, to come up with different ways of trying to use that DNA testing back to people that are from those areas in Ireland and say, well, hold on a second, if we're linking with Irish people that have no known immigrant ancestors, there must be a connection here on one of their lines back to this particular part of Ireland, which is the exciting part of DNA with genealogy. But that's kind of going off topic, but that's what I would say. I mean, we are, we're a nation of traveled peoples, essentially. Um, just not in Ireland. Start. <laughs> yeah, just not in Ireland. And that's that's the, that's the massive distinction. Yeah. When we're talking about people living in Ireland, it's very, very unusual, particularly the further west you go in the country, where it gets more rural and more impoverished, for people to travel long distances to, to marry or to have children. Um, and a lot of that is tight. There's the reason is it's tight to land, uh, access to land meant living, essentially. Uh, and people generally didn't leave the land that their ancestors had because it was their with their lifeblood, and the ones that didn't have access to land in that family unit emigrated. It's as simple as that. If you are looking for your Irish ancestors that have left Ireland, I take it that's where immigration records are, are useful. Yeah. So what sort of records then would we be looking for? And I don't know if anyone, if you want to pick this one up, in terms of if our ancestors have left Ireland. Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is, is you, you touched on it there, is immigration records in terms of passenger ship lists would be the first one. And it really depends on what time period the people have left Ireland that you're looking for. So typically speaking, if somebody's left anywhere between 1906 and 1922, you get very detailed ship records that gives the last known address in Ireland. Uh, that's going to the US, should I say. Uh, and yeah. The same with records to Australia. They get very detailed um, county or parish of origin uh, on, on the ship records. Uh, because Ireland is part of the United Kingdom and Canada is also part of the United Kingdom for all intents and purposes, generally speaking, the ship records don't survive because essentially it was seen as moving from one part of the kingdom to another. It wasn't leaving one country and going to a different one. Um, so those those kind of records don't uh, survive before 1922 online uh, in any of the major genealogy websites. But going beyond passenger records themselves, you've got naturalization records, particularly, again, I'm thinking of people in the US, if they want to become a United States citizen to, to vote and to be entitled to other, uh, other, other things that you had to be naturalized to do, um, they would apply for naturalization. And that was a process. There was a, a few different forms. You had a declaration of intention, 
uh, the naturalization form itself. And quite often those do give a very specific place of origin too. Um, so you can match that up with the family that you have. Um, church records is another one that you yeah. see. Typically, uh, people are recorded where they're from, and that's not just Catholic records. I've seen it in Church of, church of Ireland records as well, both in the adopted country and in the home country. I've seen records where it says in the Irish Church of Ireland records that they've left and gone to this place. Mm-hmm. And in the corresponding place in the US, I've seen them from this place in Ireland. So it's about linking that up. Pres- uh, Presbyterian records are quite similar, as well as Quaker uh, they do need a certificate of removal, uh, as Jenny well knows. She's had piles of Quaker experience this past year or so. Um, so, yeah, church records would be another one. Uh, I won't mention them all. I'll give Jenny a chance to, to have a few as well. Yeah, um, I'm just p- picking up on that. Um, don't be afraid to contact churches. I'll give you an example. I'm uh, looking for someone at the minute who got married in Cork in 1890. I know he was born in Scotland. I know from his marriage record who his father was, and I know he was a soldier. But the surname is Brown, and there is a plethora of Browns knocking around Scotland. I think there's about 20 different men with Father Robert born in the right period. But I just called up the church and I asked them, you know, do you have anything different in the marriage record? Which is 1890 now, so it's it's fairly recent. And yeah, I found out exactly what brigade he was in. So I can now go off when I get time to sit down and do it. I can go look for this man. I know he. I know John Brown was on the Rifle Brigade, and I wouldn't have found that anywhere else. Only for the fact that I I got onto the church itself. Um, in England, I think census records are key, but also newspapers. Mm. If you start searching newspapers, because you will find that they might have been involved in an incident or they might have been involved in union activity or they might have had a terrible accident at work that was reported in the newspaper. And it might say something like, you know, John Doyle from County Wexford died at this mine in Wales. And that's how you start. That also helps you to start building up family groups because you start seeing, you know, all these people clustering around each other. So that's what we call the fan club. It's your friends, associates and neighbours. Because Irish people didn't emigrate in, in isolation. They went to where they had already connections. Thinking about people who have Irish ancestors, who over here, they may have been able to look at workhouse records because, you know, their Irish ancestors went through a particularly tough time. Are there any records that you could think of where people may may look? Fewer than there are in England. Right. OK. OK. Um, Dublin, there are some Dublin workhouse records. There's prison registers because poor people sadly end up in prison because it's for theft or whatever. They need to eat. Uh, yeah. Um, I know some workhouses around the country have records and I've only looked at them a handful of times because very often they're books of minutes and they don't actually give anything useful. They might say something like, there was 10 women admitted to the maternity ward today or, you know, 10 women gave birth and left. But there's not as many as there are in England. England has a much bigger collection of records than we do. Is that because that some of your, I know obviously a lot of records were destroyed in in the two fires. Is it also the case though, that in Ireland you would benefit from going to a records office or from going to potentially a, a particular parish? Is it that some of the records are not online yet or is it that they just simply don't exist? I think it's I think it's a bit of both. Um, so I should say that there's not one repository that has all of the workhouse records and they're very mm-hmm. county specific. So it is worth trawling the county council archives, which is how I would recommend people to search for those workhouse records after you've looked at the legs of ancestry or find my past, because whatever main collections have survived are on those websites. Some some part, some counties have digitized some of their own records and put them up as PDFs on those websites. But I would echo Jenny's point. A lot of those are minute books. They're not necessarily the registers that name the people. And there's a very, very particular reason for that. I think a lot of the, a lot of the time, and it's somewhat political in some ways, you have to remember that this was this was introduced in 1838 and really a lot of people availed of the workhouse during the famine period 
and it was seen as quite a shameful thing to, to enter the workhouse. So quite ha- quite often what happens is as the years go by, families try and hide the fact that their ancestor or their you know their mother, father, grandfather, whatever it may be, had stayed in the workhouse during the famine and survived that way. And it was seen as very shameful. I mean, I don't understand it myself, but that's 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 history sometimes. It just it is what it is. And as a result, if you keep coming right up until 1922, those workhouses were still in, in, in action. They were still being used for the exact same purpose as they were introduced in 1838. And then we have Irish Civil War, sorry, we have the Irish um, Revolutionary War, followed by the Civil War. And what happens is those records are deliberately destroyed um, as a way of kind of hiding that shameful past of people. Because, and it goes back to what Jenny said about, uh, about the, the four courts records, there's some historians out there that would say that that's a way of Irish people trying to wipe their historical slate clean and start again yeah. um, and create a new state. And, and and those records are another reason, another exact, you know, a replica of that reason um, is, the, is the quickest way to, I suppose, to get rid of that shame that people mm-hmm. had. Uh, and that does tie into why those records don't survive, those detailed names. Well, to echo that, the Custom House fire. So the Public Records Office fire is an accident. The custom house fire was deliberate. So uh, there were different records housed in both, but it was Mm -hmm. the wills, for example, in the customs house, they went out, it was monetary records. So your tax and your wills and your probates, a lot of those were held in the custom house. Um, And they were just set on fire. Like, believe it or not, Michaela, uh, one of the first things I remember writing in, in national school uh, was mm-hmm. in a workhouse book because uh, we had the workhouse book in our national school just left in a bookshelf and everybody used to sign their name to the back of it. I never understood why it was there or, you know, why mm-hmm. people were writing on it a hundred years later or whatever it was. But, you know, that's, you know, they just didn't, didn't take any great care of it um, for whatever mm-hmm. reason. There are school records, though. A lot of national schools um, have existed for quite a long time. And very often, just in the attic of the school, they will have the old school registers. So if you know where your ancestor lived, it's actually sometimes worth just calling the school and seeing if they'll... Because you, you might find out, you know, little things. It's like roll call or what their nickname was or if, quite, what their name was in Irish. Mm-hmm. Particularly after 1922, national schools, they... Um, they try to encourage the use of Irish because it had been on the decline for a couple of hundred years. Um, it still hasn't quite reached anywhere near the levels that it was, but you know, so that just, I was just thinking their national schools would be a, they're another a very interesting little record collection that you don't really think of. Absolutely. And, and, and in order to, again, to go back to the, you know, the context behind it, you can see how many days the children have missed school, more mm-hmm. days a child has missed school, particularly if they're from the same family, I would say probably the poor the family are because those yeah. children will be taken out to, to work on the farm. Um, also, you get the idea of what kind of you know grades they get, uh, which is also mm-hmm. very interesting insight into our ancestors. Um, but yeah, school records is definitely very very underutilized in Irish genealogy. Can you think of any good records that relate to occupation or industry? I know that you know agriculture was was the main uh, source of of employment during the 19th century um, but are there any records that you could recommend if somebody's looking to find out more about what their ancestor Irish ancestor did for a job there's the fisherman records the sea the, mer- the merchant seamen records um, they're on the National Archives of Ireland website and um, there's also indexes on ancestry and find my past mm-hmm. um, but basically if you if your ancestor was a fisherman on a boat um, They'd go off to sea. You can see how many days they went at sea. So I found that um, one of my dad's great great grandfathers used to regularly sail from in where near where the office is in Dublin City, out to where I live. You know, on the boat to be out for four or five days. Looking at the island, I can see right now, and then he'd go back to Ringsend, and I can see all that in the records. And that's that's one occupation set. Um, we don't have apprenticeship records in the same way the US, UK, UK does. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, though, there, Amy. No, not definitely not on digitized for sure. I mean, there is some records. I remember we looked at some baker's records, for example. Yes. There's apprenticeship records for those. But they're very, you know, they're not massive data sets. They wouldn't necessarily have 
the nationwide um, remit, it would be more, you know, one guild, and that would be it. Um, but one thing I would think of really quickly would be the, the police records are fascinating. Yeah. Um, you can track people and families from area to area. Um, another one would be national school teacher records are actually fascinating as well. Yeah. Um, and, and they would have, both of those collections would have nationwide uh, coverage. Um, I'm just trying to think what else. British Army records. So an awful mm -hmm. lot of Irishmen served in the British Army because it was a guaranteed paycheck. So if you think about it, Ireland can be quite, it was a quite an impoverished country. What do you do? You go into the army. You're a British, you're a British subject, whether you're politically affiliated or not, it is what it is. So you went and you worked in the British army and you got, you signed up for, I think it was 21 years. It's 21 years at, you know, at least a shilling a day. You get your food, everything. You can have your wife, your children. You can bring them around with you. You can travel the world. So if you do have Irish ancestors, I would, and you think they might have served in the army, definitely look at the British army records. Just to finish off this section before we move on, can you both give me your top five Irish records? So what are your favourite, and if you can think of five each, Irish records um, that people should be looking at, <laughs> utilising, it might be just a record that brought you a bit of joy in your family tree. It might have brought you a bit of misery. We'll take mm -hmm. either or on this show. Um, so, Jennifer, <sighs> you are next to me. I've just called you Jennifer. That makes me I feel like you're one. Um, <laughs> Jenny, you are next to me on the screen. So do you want to, for the, all those listeners out there who've got Irish ancestors, give me your favourite five Irish records? Um, okay, well, top of my list is always going to be the Petty Sessions because I love the drama. Um, love it. Then, cool. Yeah, I love dog license registers. The dog license registers are great. They get, tell you absolutely nothing other than your great grandfather had a terrier or a basset hound or, a, you know, some sort of hound's dog. Um, the other one would be the Griffiths maps. I love a good map. You know that I gave a yep. ridiculously long lecture on maps to your class. <laughs> um, so that's what four. Uh, and then I, for my sins, I'm going to say the Quaker records. The Quaker records are absolutely amazing because you get to see all those lovely Quaker names. Um, they and also the Quaker, the equivalent of the Quaker minute books, so the me the meeting records, where it's something like you know. John Smith, he needs to be talked to for his disorderly walking. And for what that, that it's actually running. The Quakers didn't like running around. Um, or other things like, you know, he married a papist or he was found drinking or something like that. So yeah, they'd be my, my top ones. Eamon? Yeah, there's a, there's a bit of crossover yeah. here. So it's, it's interesting <laughs> as well, because I work with Jenny and of course we know each other very well, but I didn't realize we were dissimilar in, in this particular aspect. I <laughs> love it. So, so I would start off with the Petty Sessions as well, because it's giving you color that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. Um, and, and similarly, the dog license records is my number two. Just to find out the names of the dogs my ancestors had is hilarious. <laughs> um, number three then is a little bit more depressing and it kind of ties into what I'm doing outside of work at the minute. So it's those poor law relief commission papers. We haven't talked about that during the podcast. But essentially, it's just um, work schemes that are going on during the famine in particular areas in the country. And they can be quite detailed and um, listing, you know, people from particular townlands that are working and for how long and what they get in return in terms of money or food. So I find that very fascinating in the social history aspect. Land and estate maps would be number four uh, for the exact same reason Jenny talked about for Griffiths maps. Just for looking at the maps and, and plotting out those areas, it's another snap snapshot in time. Again, we didn't get to talk about that. But essentially, it's a land tax. Uh, it's a it's a tax, but tax would be the wrong word. It's a sale catalog for for land, basically, that has been bankrupted by the landlord. So they give great, fascinating detail. And the last one, then I think that four or five I might have gone over. Yeah, I'm fine. Last, yeah. last yeah. one is again poor law minute books. Now they're they're horribly depressing. Um, but I'm I'm researching that at the minute in terms of my PhD. So. I've really delved deep into those minute books. They don't give a whole lot of uh, very specific information regarding ancestors, but they can give a really great picture of what's going on in the area as a whole. 
at a particular time. So four long minute books would be what I would be talking about there. Number five. I'm going to throw in one last one, The Deeds. The Deeds. I do like my re registry of deeds. Um, these escaped the fire and you didn't have to register deeds, but going back to what, a picking up what Eamon said earlier about, um, no one in Ireland owning their land and you had a very small, small set of landlords, everyone else rented. If you wanted to preserve your deed to make sure your landlord wasn't going to screw you over, you could memorialize it in the registry of deeds. And some of the things you find in deeds are great. You can get back three generations of a family in deeds. So. I'd go for the deeds. They're not, they're not indexed. Um, they are only available on familysearch.org with images. Um, or you can go into the wonderful building that houses them in Henrietta Street in Dublin. My last question to both of you is if you could invite one person from your family tree for dinner tonight and you could ask them a question. Who would it be? Who would you invite? What would you cook? And what would you ask them? Eamon, why don't we start with you? Ooh, that's... So who, who would I pick? So who would you pick? You can pick one person from your family tree. Yeah. It can be anybody in your family tree. So it would have to be my paternal grandmother. So I never got to meet either of my grannies. Um, they were both dead long before I was born. And... It's one of these things, every person I meet, particularly of that generation, they tell me that I'm like my grandmother and I've never met her, so I would like to meet her. And um, that would be the answer to that one. And what, uh, would, what would I cook? Yeah. What would I cook? Yeah, what would I cook her? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not the I'm not the most accomplished cook, so I'm not sure what I'd cook her. Probably bacon and cabbage and keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> bacon and cabbage, what a mixture. I like it. Yeah. Jenny, you are next. Who are we inviting from your family tree? What are you cooking them? And have you got a question you'd like to ask them? Um, okay, probably a Smith as well. And Eliza Smith, my grand, my father's great great grandmother, who was the Bristolian one. Uh, why is she? Why? Why was she in Dublin? I have a feeling it's because her father was a glass blower. And I wouldn't let her cook. I wouldn't. I'd let her cook me dinner because I would love to see what her Dublin coddle recipe is like. <laughs> Uh, coddle is my favorite. It's one of my favorite dinners. I always say if I had to have my last meal, it'd be my dad's coddle. What, um, what, 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 what is coddle for those that are? Uh, it is a very traditional Irish dish. It's basically boiled sausages and potatoes with rashers and God knows what else you want to put into it. Every family has their own recipe, which is why I would love to see. She lived in just on the outskirts of inner city Dublin. I'd love to see what her recipe was in and around the turn of the century. Guys, thank you so much for being on this week's podcast. Hopefully, uh, you will agree to come back on again. Of course. And um, I know I'd love to hear more about your work, Eamon, especially with the poor law records. My PhD is focused on death, but predominantly working class deaths in the 19th century. So um, I've looked at uh, many of those records myself. Jenny, we must do a Quaker week. <laughs> we must do a quake a week let's do a quake a week just for our okay. day and we can talk about quake i'm never going to escape quakers <laughs> so that is it for this week i really hope you enjoyed listening we will be back a new episode drops every monday if you have a question for me or for one of our future guests please feel free to drop me a message. You can do so via my website, which is www.michaelahume.com. Or if you're watching it on YouTube, just drop a comment in the box. Have a great week. I hope the sun is shining where you are. It is shining in the north. The weather is glorious at the minute. So have a good week. Happy researching. Until next time. <laughs>